Welcome to our Train Smart episode. We're gonna be talking about fitness programming and happy to have on as a guest, Kevin Mullins, and he is the author of Day by Day. Welcome, Kevin. Hey, man, what's up? Good to get, uh, get, here, on, get on here with you. Absolutely, man. Well, welcome. I look forward to, you know, kind of talking about, you know, fitness programming. And I know as coaches, as even even clients as well, we we really strive on how to promote the best capacities that we can, you know, providing the best programming, you know, putting something into a template, knowing that it's going to result into the best outcome. And there's a variety of things that we're going to be talking about today. And I just want to kind of take some time to introduce you. I mean, you know, me and Kevin have known each other for roughly, I think, maybe four or five months. Um, we also work for PPSC, the Pain Free Performance Specialist Certification. I think it's been four months or five, right? Four years, 26 days. I don't know. Uh, I have no concept of time anymore. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Well, I will let you take it over, man. I'm going to have you kind of just explain your background, your work experiences. I know that you've uh, currently kind of just came into a new role that's uh, big time. So I take some time to kind of talk about you. Uh, I'll start with what you led in with. I am, in fact, the author of a book called Day by Day. I actually grabbed one here so people can see what it looks like. Um, it's, uh, it was my pride and joy. It is a very literal daily meditation for the fitness professional um my inspirations came from i read i was reading ryan holiday's daily stoic and i thought it was awesome um and we've all had those like daily calendars and stuff like that that give you a thought and i was like what if what if something like that existed for the fitness professional and talk about all the variety of challenges that we face because it is a very unique career and so i started i broke down the months in different topics like february's education January's professionalism. I end the year December with taking care of yourself. We do some myth busting in there, stuff like that. Um, programming. Uh, and it's just sort of this, hey, read this. It takes you no more than two minutes. Uh, and it gives you a thought. And it's the accumulation of my experience. And my experience is uh, I got certified when I was 20. Uh, I was a junior. Yeah, I was a junior at the University of Maryland studying kinesiology. I was working at a gym. Uh, that summer, I had just gotten into fitness about a year and a half before. Like I was working out to, you know, look good or be athletic, but to really get into the science, the nuts and bolts of it, uh, thanks to bodybuilding.com forums back in the day, um, uh, happened when my early years of college and I got certified and got a job at this little tiny uh, franchise gold's gym that went under, but I ended up landing in Washington, D.C. at a uh, brand known as the Sports Club L.A. Uh, they're now defunct, uh, but they were, you know, the leader in uh, health club space, you know, the, the bougie space, if you will. Uh, and when they went under, they were bought out by Equinox. And then I spent uh, almost eight complete years in that building, five of which were with Equinox. Um, while there, I was a master instructor, so I taught. Uh, education curriculum to the other trainers. I did group fitness classes, everything from boot camps, my own little creation, uh, and then uh, spin spin classes. And uh, Dr. Russell likes to make fun of that every now and again, uh, but I'm good with it. Uh, anything to get people moving. And then uh, I was a personal trainer. And in that time there, I did, between the two companies, I did almost 20,000 training sessions. Uh, I've technically done 20,000 if I count my private clients that I've always had on the side, but you know, that's that thing where hush, hush, don't tell anyone. Um, and then thousands of group classes in education. Since then I have landed at the leader in health, sports, fitness and wellness uh, and active entertainment at the St. James. We have a single complex right now in Springfield, Virginia. It is 450,000 square feet. We have a full NFL field, soccer field, uh, four basketball courts, volleyball courts, a literal Olympic size swimming pool. Uh, what equates to like an indoor Chuck E. Cheese, but with more of an athletic emphasis. We have an e gaming arena, we have a ho uh, two hockey rinks, and then a full uh, 60,000 square foot health club and all those amenities. Uh, hitting cages, a uh, full gymnastics arena. Um, it's awesome. Restaurant, stores, spa. Um, and so I'm the director of product development there. I was recruited away to basically develop our fitness and sport identity, um, which is something I take a lot of pride in because 
Uh, I don't consider myself the typical trainer story. I'm actually working on a piece for my own website now where, you know, everybody's like, oh, I was a good athlete and I wanted to stay engaged in sports or uh, I was a really out of shape person. And as I changed my life, like I was just an average dude who just started stacking work days and then I liked it more and I realized I had the skill set. And then, you know, one thing led to the next. And honestly, I, I didn't set out to be where I am now when I got certified at 18. I was like, oh, you know, this is cool. I can be a personal trainer. I'll have abs and girls will want to date me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I say all that to say that it's fun to use my brain uh, a little bit more. And that's not to say, because I love personal trainers, that's not to say we don't use our brain, but I have to think, uh, you know, big picture stuff, revenue drivers, you know, how you build these customer avatars, this, that, and the other. So it, it's, it's kind of awesome. No, that's awesome, man. I mean, I mean, I love the book. That's like the biggest thing a lot, a lot of individuals are trying to succeed. And definitely with the current situations that are happening around the world, we kind of need those blueprints. We kind of need some sort of structure and more of like a motivation to keep us moving. And, you know, those particular calendar formats are going to be things that are going to promote us to do better at our job. And there's a variety of books out there that really hit the dot on ways that we can succeed as a trainer, as a coach. And as you mentioned, you know, there's so much that goes into it. You know, it's, you know, it is more than just, you know, looking good and, you know, that it's like we really strive on helping people. We really want to yeah. push the efforts of making a program that not necessarily is going to be engaging and fun because that should be in part of it. Like, you know, that's fitness programming at its finest. You got to make sure people are involved with it, but you want to make sure that your clients are getting the results that they want. And, and that is truthfully one of the biggest things is making sure they're having a fun time, moving pain free, which obviously, you know, all about that as well. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's the big thing. I mean, you, you have written a book that really hits home and it, it really provides that blueprint to everything. And I highly recommend it. If you guys are looking for a good book out there, get that book. I know it's on Amazon. I'm actually looking at it's roughly 15, I think 15 bucks right now for paperback. So get that book. Definitely will help advance your career and make you think about other things that you have never done before. But to kind of move forward into this episode, we're really going to talk about fitness programming. And the things that we're going to be hitting on is ways that we can amplify the ways that you're looking at your client and being like, what can I do to make them move better? What can I do to make them achieve their results of weight loss, getting stronger, performing better on the football field, you know, being a cycle instructor, there's so much that goes into it, but it's all about having fun, but we really need to use our brain. You know, that, that's like the best part, you know, you got to enjoy it. But um, was there anything else that you wanted to add on before we uh, move forward? No, I think that's spot on. I think when we talk about the fun factor, right, I think that's a really cool uh, point that I like to hammer home when I speak, you know, at different events is we don't do things that we're not good at. Dane, can you sing? No. Booze not included. Would you karaoke a very hard song in front of strangers? You're not allowed to drink. You have to just go up there and you have got to carry like John Legend, all of me. Probably not me, but my brother would. My brother would. Okay. But can he sing? Yeah, he's pretty good. Oh my God. Exactly. So here's the thing, because... We can't count alcohol in the karaoke example because let's be honest, those two were made to be together. But um, people who aren't good at a musical talent would not put themselves on stage, you know, to sound horrible. And that's, of course, considering there's always outliers. There's always that crazy person who sings in the shower who thinks they're good and genuinely doesn't care. But I digress. When it comes to fitness programming, one of the things that we have to focus on, it isn't just fun because you know what's fun sitting on a deck having a margarita on Cinco de Mayo or watching a brand new movie you've been excited about so that doesn't mean sports and fitness can't be fun but fun is kind of a, a spread thin word now yeah. the key is to find things that our clients are already good at and our industry we need our assessments we need our screens but our industry has taken this little bit too functional turn and is too quick to be like you can't do this you can't do that how have you not died like, what the hell are you doing walking around right now? Like, you should be in a wheelchair 
eating through a straw because you got a one out of one on the FMS, yeah. right? Like there's these reactions to these dysfunctions, which are totally real, but far too many trainers began an exercise journey by spending too much time trying to fix things and not enough time saying, all right, well, you're already good at this. Let's help you get more proficient because when you do something you're good at, it makes you happy. You can do it a little bit harder, right? I remember when I first started learning the guitar, I could play for 10 minutes and then my fingertips would hurt so bad that I couldn't hit a chord anymore and I'd have to stop. Or my right arm would be so tired from strumming, right? And you can lift all the weights you want, but that micro wrist thing with a guitar pick, like that's different. But it took time and I calloused up my fingers and my arm got used to holding the guitar. And before long, I could practice longer and I was having fun because it sounded better. Early on, I wanted to chuck the guitar out the window. And so I want to start this programming conversation by imploring all trainers, yes, work on the things you find in your screens and assessments. Find that quick yes or no, as we talk about in the PPSC. But it's also about, okay, yes, and let's train the crap out of that because it's going to get you results and you're already kind of good at it. That doesn't mean we got to spend 55 minutes of a 60 minute session doing only the things you're good at to, to stroke your ego. But it does mean spend a little time making you happy instead of making you hate this date on your calendar. Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, you hit the dot with that. I mean, you, you know, a lot of individuals, you know, they look past the assessment, you know, they don't really do consultations. They kind of just believe in the method of going right into it. And you can already kind of tell that right from the get go, man, if you're just starting this conversation, you have that passion, you have that drive that really kind of promotes, you know, the, the longevity of working in the fitness industry. But what really to you is like that driving factor to provide the best program for your clients? Honestly, it just starts with a general sense of stewardship. And that's one of my favorite words. It's actually one of my company's founding values, our core values, stewardship to care. Um, I didn't get in the fitness industry just because I wanted to look good. I didn't get into this because I wanted to be the guy. We didn't have Instagram back then, but I didn't want to only post me. And I, to this day, cringe when I see trainers only post themselves. The secret to programming is giving a real damn about the individual, not just the client, right? And I've written about this a bunch. I've said it in speeches. Like It's called personal training, right? To be clear, strength and conditioning with teams is a little different. You're not able to get into the client's story as much and, and, and play off the individual motivators as much. So if you're working in you know, semi-large groups or you're in a very large team-based environment, some of that personality and personalization can be left to the side in favor of just this is programming that works. But when we're talking on that one-on-one -on -one or really small groups scenario, it's asking the questions that unveil the real why. Like, why is someone here with me, right? Because it's easy in our brains to be like, well, deadlifting a lot of weight is super cool and it strengthens your glutes and hamstrings and it stabilizes your hip and limits low back pain if done right. And training the core allows you to do cool shit and, you know, <laughs> and locking in the pillar, uh, you know, like we can get caught up in the minutia and we should, it's our craft, right? If you've ever gone out with a group of people who have a different career, but they're all in the same career, they get caught up talking shop too. You catch plumbers talking about the right way to do a fit or, you know, welders. They're definitely, if you know any welders, they'll definitely talk about their techniques. And so it's cool that we're passionate about the science and the techniques, but it first and foremost is pay attention to what the client really wants and what their relationship to exercise is, right? I've had some really great clients over the years that for one reason or another, the second there was knurling on something, they were done. Yeah. They hated it. They didn't want to buy gloves, which whatever, but you know, they didn't want to buy gloves. So if I gave them two 70 kilo bells, one on each side of their body, and they were doing kettlebell deadlifts, they were fine. But if I put less weight on the hex bar, 
The second they felt that knurling, things started falling apart. So it was like, okay, I'm just not going to use these rough things because it shuts you down. So that's just one little example, but understanding why a person's come to you and then actually caring about developing a program that makes sense for them. Because if you do those first couple ones right, you'll be amazed the doors and barriers you knock down. And then suddenly they're way more open to trying new things. Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, you hit the dial with that. You know, it's really about building relationships with people. And, you know, building that rapport is really going to provide the positivity towards a person's program. You know, it's, I've heard this from uh, an individual. I can't remember off the, the top of my head, but learn the person's name before you coach them. You know, that, that kind of hit home for me is, you know, instead of just, you know, making assumptions and making all these corrective yes or no's, or this is your range of motion, like learn who the hell they are. Like make sure that you understand what potentially they're dealing with and all these things before you actually assume these specific ranges and movement capacities. You know, it's about building that relationship. You know, I've, I've done that. It's like relationships always continue to learn. Assessments always continue to develop. And what I mean by that is, you know, as you're learning the individual, the assessment protocol is always going to be continuing day by day. It's like, it's literally just going to continue to move forward. It's always going to be that path that you're always learning something. And, and I've always had, and I guarantee you've experienced this too within the last couple of years of your career and just overall as well, is you may have had that one assessment with somebody and then four months down the road, you learn that they tore their ACL like six years ago. You're like, wait a, wait a minute, what? You're like, when did, when did this happen? So it's like, you know, people don't really want to provide as much information when they don't really trust you yet. And like a, I use the analogy all the time is a training session shouldn't feel like a physical, yep. right? Like for us guys, you know, you sit in there, touch a little this, a little stethoscope here turn your head and cough. Like, I can't speak to what a female physical is, but I, you get the point of like, it's very cold and clinical. And it's like, all right, are we done here? Like, can you let me know I'm good and I can get on my way because I don't like anything about this? We can't do that in our field yeah. because so much of success is trust. Yeah. Like one of my pet peeves amongst, and younger trainers tend to do this, is bullshitting the rep counts or durations yeah. they'll be like all right do 10 and then they get to 10 and they're like all right do two more all right two more and you're like <laughs> no no if they can do 15 you probably should have got a little bit heavier of a weight first of all and second of all don't toy with a person's trust of you yeah. because you do that to me once it's funny right you're like oh you're such a mean trainer but if consistently consistently you tell me one thing and do the other i don't trust you yeah. And I'm going to show up to the, to the session with a little less trust. And I'm going to be like, I don't know what's in the, I, I don't know if they even know what they're doing, that type of thing. Um, and to the point of assessment, I found investing a longer amount of time. And this dates back with my Equinox hours where things were a little bit more scripted. We have the Equifit there and uh, mandatory FMS, in-body, stuff like that. Um, I found the longer I spent just having conversations and the less time I worried about explaining why the FMS even matters or, you know, doing the in-body or whatever I may have done, the better chances I had of even converting the client. And then the better the chances of me actually developing a meaningful program, getting results and maintaining a client. Yeah. Um, because the data from the assessments helps inform us, but it does nothing for the client. Yep. And I think that's imperative for trainers to remember that while the assessment is taking place, unless our clients are very body conscious and they want to learn, which there are some out there that are very curious, oh, what does that mean that I can't do this? And then you explain it. Our clients don't care. They, they have a fitness or performance goal and even if it's as simple as I just want to lose some pounds and not be so winded, or if it's as, hey, I'm a small school uh, corner and I, I really think I can make a tryout, I just got to work on some basic agility, right? In that range, most clients don't necessarily care about the why and even the how. They just care about the what, when, and how many times. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and so 
programming is the, the what we do in the dark so we shine in the light sort of thing. I love that. Oh, I, I like that saying. That's a good one. I like yeah, that. I mean, if you think about it, like you, you should be able to inform your clients about why you're doing some of the things and you tailor that explanation to, you know, their relative interest and knowledge on the subject matter. So if I was training you, Dane, and we really got into this, I'd be like, listen, we're going to do some unilateral hip hinges at the beginning. I know you're used to doing the big heavy stuff like your sumo deadlifts at the beginning, but I really want to prime you because the sum of the whole is going to be greater if each of these individual parts, you have better hip hinge control, you got better pillar stability. And then when we bring it back together with your deadlift, you're going to be blown away at how much stronger you feel and how much more natural your hinge feels, right? So that's just one example. But if I took that same thing to like, hey, I'm just here so I don't get fat. Like, you remember Marshawn Lynch back in the day? He's like, I'm just here so I don't get fined. I, I remember that, yep. Right? And that was his only answer to the press's questions. Fact of the matter is, most clients are here so they don't get fat. And that's okay. It's not a judgment thing. But for most people, it is a purely, I don't want to be extremely unhealthy or lack vanity. And that's cool. So to that client, the programming description would be, hey, we're going to do some single leg work. I know you don't love balance. We're going to find ways to get, help you out with your balance. But what we're going to do is try to make one leg and then the other leg strong on their own. That way, when we put them together, you're able to do some more uh, adventurous and, and uh, beneficial things that are going to drive up your metabolism, right? Always going back to what they care about, metabolism or function or whatever. Yeah, absolutely, man. That's huge. I mean, you know, the communication and what you actually say to clients is, is the difference of, you know, opinion on that. Like, you know, where it's just like you got the opinion of one individual and you got the opinion of the other individual and you got to bridge that gap a little bit. I, I love that you talked about this a couple minutes ago. You were actually talking about, you know, being a young coach and talking about, you know, like, oh, let's do 10 or 10 reps and then, okay, two more. Okay, now two more. It's like, you know, you're kind of putting yourself up for failure. But my next question to you is, you know, when, you're working with somebody and, you know, you've developed all this experience, knowledge, everything within your head. What would you recommend to young coaches as tips for programming? Like what would be your number one thing, maybe back to yourself or to someone that you're working with that's a little bit younger into the field? First and foremost, I would say it starts with a warm up. Um, it starts with being intelligent in the design of that first 10 to 15 minutes. As we talk about in the PPSC, we have these phases that we utilize to get people from, I'm not here, like, I, I'm not ready to work out to, oh my God, where's the hard stuff? And without going into detail, it's like those phases allow us to address various mobility, stability issues. They allow us to prime movements, get them more alert. Um, so first and foremost, to all young trainers, and if I could go back in time to myself, is warming up is not five minutes on a treadmill while you finish your tuna. And it's also not, hey, let's lay on this foam roller and hit every single nook and cranny in your body like you're a waffle and I'm butter. Like, we're not trying to go too far. And, you know, focus on, for the, once we get into the exercise programming, it becomes focus on the big nuggets they can't do for themselves. I know early in my career, I was more into the bodybuilding type stuff. So it was very easy for me to be like, we're gonna chest presses and some girls, today's shoulder day. And to be clear, you know, some clients do want more of the body part split because they have more bodybuilding or body toning-esque goals, that's fine. But our, we need to educate ourselves as coaches in the dark so we shine in the light to do the things that clients either will do poorly on their own or will just completely skip. Yeah. One of the greatest things that ever happened to me was letting my wife write my program. My wife is a tier X coach at the Equinox here in DC. That's actually how we met. Uh, she got hired and I was like, I like her. And then <laughs> took about 72 attempts to get her to go on a date with me. But from there uh, we dated for a while and now we're married as of October. But um, she wrote a program, and if there's anything that old me hated, it was single leg training. I found every reason to be like, oh, you, yeah, I'll just squat, because, you know, 
why would I do less weight for more reps? That sounds horrible. And next thing I know, I got better because of that training. And so I say that to say that we have to make people do the things they won't do for themselves while still considering the fun factor, while still considering their relative goal set and the intensity of those goals. Like, I want to fight King Kong. I just don't want to get fat. That's okay. Wherever you are, I've got to gear it up. So if it's like, I don't really care if I can single, de single leg deadlift with a barbell. Cool, you're right. We'll just get two dumbbells, one in each hand. We don't have to go crazy, but do you feel your hamstrings? Yeah, awesome. This is working, right? So once we get to the exercise section, it's spend the bulk of your time on the things that your clients are going to do poorly or will skip. And so it's going to be the unilateral training. It's going to be legitimate core stability training. Um, and what I mean by that is more of the uncomfortable planks, plank saws, you know, power dead bugs, power bird dogs, um, half kneeling, tall kneeling, carry patterns, uh, and then the hinge for sure, right? Like every client can benefit from a hinge. So, um, you know, you focus on that. And then when it comes to the accessories, that's where you really just make your clients happy. For the vast majority of your clients, you pay attention. Oh, I want a bigger butt. I want bigger arms. I wish I could see my abs more. And yes, for the millionth time to the industry, we know abs are made in the kitchen. But doing some crunches with control or leg raises isn't going to make your spinal vertebrae shoot out of your back, right? Now, if you come to me, Dane, and you've got a wrecked spine already and you've got like a fused vertebrae, maybe we're not going to do these things. But for the vast majority of people, eight to 10 minutes of some dedicated ab work. Oh, I feel like I just cursed. Ab work isn't going to ruin them, and it's going to help them hypertrophy those muscles a little bit. And even if they're still struggling with their diet, there's going to at least be a harder core, and then you're winning. So they're getting a little bit of what they want. And so it's spend the necessary amount of time getting the client ready to succeed. Yep. Pick the KPIs and the challenging primary exercises that the clients are probably going to skip or if they do them, they're liable to get hurt or under train them. Right. Another example before we switch thoughts is, and I'm in no way to be clear, taking, making this a gender thing, but a lot of women I've worked with over my life, I'm like, Hey, do you do squats? They're like, Oh, of course I squat. I, I want a nice butt. Okay. Well, like, what do you, what weights do you do? Oh, I use the group group fitness weights. So like the, the 25s. Oh no, I, I use the eights okay, we probably want to squat heavier, right? And so it's not just do things wrong, but also not doing things with enough intensity. And you're like, trust me, you can squat your body weight. You'll be fine. It'll take some time to build up, but trust me, this, this will get you the results you want. And so uh, there's those, and then you get to the accessories and it's focusing on whatever it is that really check marks the, this was a good workout for my client. Um, and then the last thing I'd add is when you look at the whole structure, is maybe emphasizing a little bit more about density. Yeah. The one thing we know about in personal training is that we have a controlled variable of time. If Dane, you and I, we go into the gym right now, especially after all of this lockdown, I'm gonna spend like an entire day there. It's gonna be a theme park. But um, if we go, we could have a 86 minute workout, right? Yeah. Because we're talking and we're doing a little of this and we're not really, constraint but whether it's small group or, or individual there's a constraint and so you realize that if you maximize the density of that time you're probably going to get a ton of results and for anybody at home who's wondering what i mean by density i just simply mean if we take the sets times the reps times the load and if that's body weight that's fine or if it's external load on the bar or whatever that's fine too you multiply that together that gives you your training volume right and you do that for every exercise then simply divide that by the amount of time it took to do it. So I, I like easy numbers with this explanation. If I do, you know, three sets of 10 with 100 pounds, that's 1,000 pounds per set for 3,000 total pounds of volume for that exercise. If it took me 10 minutes to do that, I did 300 pounds a minute of density. So, and then we can strive to move that density up or the volume up or whatever. And that allows us to really get a really amazing progression for the general fitness client. Yeah. 
Now, obviously, people with really specific goals, that's not the measure we want, but that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, absolutely, man. There's so much that goes into it, you know, as, you know, being a young coach, it's like, I put a lot of thought and, you know, in programs, but I'll be honest, like when I look back at my programs that I made 10 years ago, 12 years ago, just getting into the fitness industry, you're like, wow, you're like, man, I didn't really know too much, but it's, you know, it's the continued efforts on my side, you know, as doing the things, as you mentioned in the dark, you know, I'm trying to make sure that I'm continuing to develop my craft, make sure that I'm putting the work in on the education side so that the services that I provide are going to lead to the results and the outcomes that my clients want. And that's the big thing, you know, it's, it's always a continued effort of learning. And, you know, as you mentioned, all the densities, the volumes and everything, you know, tracking is not necessarily a bad thing. You know, sometimes, you know, we kind of look at coaches and be like, oh, like you're on your pen and paper and everything. How can you not remember it? But it's like, no, if you're taking the time to, you know, write your clients workouts down or even on a tablet or something like that, that means you have a path and you have a vision for what you're trying to get with your client, you know randomly shooting some workout over with your client will it get the results that they want yes but potentially will it be a little bit altered and it might reduce the amount of time to be there you know that's that's the thing about it is your clients are dedicating their hard-earned money into a 60-minute session an hour and a half session whatever the case may be and we want to make sure that they're getting the best out of it you know and we talked a little bit about performance and these different parameters that we can be looking out for as a coach as a young coach as an any coach what would be your way to kind of like maximize the functional return for an individual? Well, I think you first have to start with what is function to that individual. Uh, in a presentation I do for SCW Mania Circuit, uh, I talk about what the funk is function. And it's really, it's whatever that client's life is, like the function of the stay-at-home mother or the, the function of the stay-at-home uh, investment banker type or the military soldier or the doctor or you know the exercise enthusiast like so function is whatever the client needs it to be now yes there are these understood levels of function like if I go to lift my arm and I can't get it past there there is dysfunction present in the shoulder whether or not I need to refer out I need to do some screens and assessments to find out some pain tests but I can agree, I think all fitness bros can agree that if I went to raise my arm and can't bring it past my chin, all right, something's going on here. But to say that I should be able to have a perfect overhead lockout in snatch position with no pain in the wrist, elbow, glenohumeral socket, or some level of scapular deviation is complete bullshit, if I can just call it that. It's you like to study anatomy and that's perfectly fine, but now you're forcing these perfect positions on people, which most people will never get to. So we first realized that function is responsible to whatever it, the person needs, while also realizing that there's some base levels of functionality to the human body that we should strive. Yeah. Everyone should, to some degree, be able to lunge, carry, push, pull, hinge, and squat, and rotate, right? Asterisk. <laughs> but what we need more than anything is to, again, going back to our very first comments, we're listening to the client's needs. So if you tell me that you don't really care how much you lift and you really mean it, maybe I don't worry about three rep maxes, but I just make sure you've got a really pain-free hinge and squat and it looks great and we do some fives here and there, but for the most part, we, we maximize the functional return by putting you in the positions that your life, sport, or desired fitness activity will put you in in any way. Yep. Because if we think about dysfunction, and I know John has talked about this, it's like, you know, there is some dysfunction by textbook standards that helps people be great. If you look at the laxity in a pitcher's shoulder, compared to their non-throwing shoulder, you would be like, oh, 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 there's a problem here. You're not symmetrical. No shit. He can sling 100 miles an hour through a little pillbox for nine innings. Can you do that? You're right, a little, little Kenny Powers. I'm not going to say the real line, but, you know, it's this sort of, if it doesn't cause pain and, and or dramatically impact your ability to perform 
most movements. You just look at it, maybe throw a couple mobility stability patterns at it. But for the most part, we just train within what works for you. Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, there's so much that goes into training and just the, the functional aspects of it. You know, I think a lot of times trainers get caught up in the word functional. You know, it's like, oh, move out oh, here. Like you're like a robot, but it's like, you know, the, the, as you mentioned right from the get go, you were talking about, well, what is function to that individual? You know, just because, you know, the a critical assessment that you kind of developed was this, but then all of a sudden they go into a snap, like, well, is that person going to be doing a snatch? Are they going to be doing a weightlifting or Olympic weightlifting? You know, so what is the, the component that they need? Of course, when you bring in sports, sports is going to be huge. And you hit the dot with just talking about the external rotation for a pitcher and all of a sudden their left arm, they can't get it up higher than that. But it's like, it's talking about the repetitions that they do on a daily basis. I mean, speak, like you're sitting there throwing a, a, a baseball at speeds that are potentially going to put your body into a format of dysfunction but it's functional for you and the return of investment and the things that you need to get done are going to look different compared to the general population somebody that's just trying to get fit maybe get a little bit stronger but i mean that's perfect you know the the return of function is going to maximize the efforts for the individual not necessarily just global return from there and I, I always think about, uh, I remember Dean Somerset, the Canadian genius himself, uh, wrote about the cost of doing business, right? And I really ran with that in my head is like, when we train a certain way, there's a cost of doing business. If you want to be the strongest person in the world, powerlifting, you're probably going to have some surgeries. You're probably going to deal with degenerative back pain and knee pain. You're probably going to have some heart issues. Like maybe not severe. We don't have enough data about powerlifters yet to know if it's truly a, a condition that, you know, stems from the heavy lifting. But you can be guaranteed that living with such high blood pressure in these short, you know, these training sessions is making some level of impact, right? Just as there's a cost of doing business at getting really good at sitting on your ass playing video games and eating food, right? There's a cost of doing business to stretching all the time. I'm sure you've had a client or two that comes to you and they're like, Gumby, they're like, I can put my foot over here. And you're like, first of all, let's put that down. And second of all, wow, why do you do that? Well, I feel tight and I'm always trying to get more loose, right? So it's that loose paradox that never quite, get, quite gets achieved. Yep. Um, and so while they have this extreme flexibility and mobility, it's come at a mass loss of stability, uh, the injury risk is through the roof. Um, and then I would argue there's some psychological, emotional components to I'm not flexible enough. Um, so yeah, it's the cost of doing business. So if I want to be a great pitcher, I have to realize that I'm going to beat the living crap out of my throwing shoulder. And I got to be okay with that. I can do everything I can. You look at a guy like Max Scherzer, one of Cressy's guys. He does a really good job of avoiding injuries. He takes his training very seriously, right? This coming shortened season, if we have it, will be a really great window into the players who take their training seriously and the players who, you know, rely a little bit on their gifts. And you also see which teams have great strength coaches who are paying attention and which teams are kind of doing it the old school baseball way of don't eat too much, too many hot dogs and drink too much beer. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you look at a guy like Max, when he got hurt in the playoffs last year, it was like such a surprise. It was like, whoa, Max is banged up. Um, and it was a lat instead of his shoulder, if I remember correctly. But nonetheless, you know, Cressy's doing it the right way and getting Max to the position where he can repeat that violent ass throwing motion over and over and over again. And most of it's coming from the big boys, the legs, the glutes the rotary muscles, the lats. And so, you know, that's how it comes from. So, you know, if you tried to fix and stabilize that right shoulder, you'd make him a worse pitcher. And he'd probably end up tearing something, right? I don't find it ironic that two of the most muscular built quarterbacks in our recent generation didn't have long careers and, and, and weren't good throwers, Brady Quinn and Tim Tebow. It was big, it was bulky, the arm came through funny, and it wasn't sustainable. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, man. There's so much that goes into that as well. You know, and it's like one of the, the questions that I have for you is, 
You know, it's like we've well, talked about so many components, so many different things that a person can put into their program. Coaches can utilize by being like, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to take that, put that into my toolbox. But like, what would be your number one thing that variable component, whatever you want to categorize it as, as putting it in and being like, you know what, if I had that number one thing, that would literally make the best program. What would be the number one thing that you would recommend using? Ooh, this is a good one. Um, when you ask this question, are you referring more to like a variable that you'd program in a specific? Yeah, you can. Yeah, or are we talking about like a foundational principle? A anything that you want, whatever comes as number one to build a program, whatever you want. Then it has to be progressive overload. Okay. I think we get caught up in this exercise is better than this exercise, or uh chasing the new shiny object too quickly um yes clients want some level of variation but they're not nearly the kitty cats that we or squirrels we paint them to be at least not most of them um progressive overload is more than just some theory you glaze over when you're getting certified or you're in a kinesiology course Progressive overload also re refers to things beyond just weight. We always talk about it like how much weight is on the bar. And that is probably its most common and appropriate use. But if we just look at running, if I go outside and I can only run for eight minutes without having to stop to walk, and then I go out tomorrow and I make it 820, and then I do 840, and then nine minutes and so on, I have progressively overloaded my cardiovascular system. I didn't go 830. I didn't, you know what I mean? Like I didn't stay at eight for weeks and hope for the best. It, so I would say the one thing that every program has to go back to is this idea of progressive overload of yeah. it's okay. If you're doing kettlebell goblet squats, if that is the hardest, best exercise for you, right? If it fits you, you do it really well and it's still challenging will go heavier and heavier and heavier. And then once the bell starts getting cumbersome and, and, and the upper body becomes the limber, then we can say, hey, we should probably find a different squat variation for you because you can squat more than you can hold in your fists, right? Progressive overload. And so I know it's not as fun to say as, oh, five by five methods, damn it. You know, Jim Wendler's five, three, one, or else you're an a-hole. It's, that's the mistake trainers make is they study and read all these applications, but they forget about the founding principles because none of these founding principles, or I'm sorry, none of these applications are found on some principle hidden in a safe somewhere. No coach who comes up with a program, no matter how great they are, has found some secret formula to unlocking some genetic potential that isn't known by other great coaches. They've just organized it and applied it differently. Yeah. And so when we design programs, if we honor progressive overload and then I, and said, I guess would be the other one, specific adaptation to impose demands. Like if you tell me you want to get better at running, but all I do is deadlift you, then I failed you, yeah. right? Like deadlifting can help you run, but I should probably run a little bit to get better at running. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, having those foundational principles, then it doesn't matter what you put on top of the cake, right? It, to me, you know, exercises are like icing on a cake. The movements are the cake itself. And the principles are the ingredients you make to make the cake. Yeah. Or bake the cake, I guess. So it's like I have sugar and flour and egg and this, that, and the other. Those are the principles. You can't really make a good, and for those culinary and baking experts out there, I know there's other ways of making gluten-free, egg-free, I know. Work with me. You never want to have anything I've ever baked. Uh, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like there's these essential ingredients that you need to make a cake. Yeah. You have those, and then you have the cake, and then you have the icing. And then, then when we start talking about rep schemas and density and volume, that's the decorative icing where you're like, happy birthday, Dane, right? And so that's the character to the program. And then the accessories or whatever you put on top that personalizes it. So if you have a child and they love firefighters and you put a little fire truck on the top of the cake, that's the accessory work and the custom work. So there, there is the conversation summed up in an analogy that I just made up on the fly. 
No, that's awesome, though. Programming is a cake. <laughs> no, but there's so much that goes into it. I think that little principle right there, principle of progression, means so much. You know, it's, you know, a lot of people always do think, as you mentioned, like it is intensity. It's all how much weight that I can lift when, no, I mean, there's frequency, there's volume, there's so much that goes into it. And it's like, you know, a simple movement can be the biggest progression you know, and to overload the body. But, you know, as you mentioned, you know, if it's a goblet squat that you stick with and you really can't get into maybe a barbell front squat, that's fine. Like, just because it looks fancy and a lot of people are posting it on social media doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do it. I mean, everything that we have talked about today has been fantastic. I mean, you know, that's the biggest thing about, you know, the fitness industry and, you know, being a coach is being able to utilize other resources, other individuals that potentially have been in the field for a very long time and that have been through the trenches and, you know, have, have done the research on their side and utilize that. You know, it's, you, we have to develop our craft that is surrounded by other people's experiences. And that's how I looked at a lot of things when I was into my career is, you know, it's taking these things that, okay, ooh, I like that. Okay, do that. But still the same thing you have to be a reasonable coach with building relationship always on your mind and I just developed an article talking about real coaching and you know you have to be real with coaching it's not necessarily just about doing the nitty-gritty making them sweat making them do that it doesn't last long when we do it that way you got to build relationships people want to have connections with people and, and have a friendship when it comes down to it but everything that we have talked about today has been fantastic actually one last thing if anyone wants to get in contact with you, how do you recommend them to reach out to you? Uh, my Instagram is at Kevin Mullins Fitness, and my website is kevinmullinsfitness.com. Uh, friend me on Facebook. Just don't try to sell me on eight-figure online training. Via. <laughs> but no, that's awesome, man. If you guys are looking for that, again, Day by Day is the, the book that he uh, wrote. And if you guys are looking to upgrade that capacity and just learn some different types of uh, – principles that you should be adding within your business, within your coaching philosophy, definitely make that purchase. It's been a pleasure, Kevin. I hope that you uh, have a great rest of your day and we'll talk soon. You too, Dan. Thanks for having me on. And thanks to everyone who, who decided to listen to me ramble. I hope we had a, a successful uh, endeavor. Absolutely. Take it easy. See you, brother.